Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are on with Pamela Clark. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you for joining us. Oh, you're so yeah. welcome. It's, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, gosh. Yeah, this is the whole time. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to find a reputable bird breeder, right? Is that right? Yes. We're talking about. Okay. Um, and um, wait, is this uh, this is, is this our first one with you in the new year with the transiting parrot? I think it is, right? We didn't do any in January. Is, you no, know, I am so sorry. I've done so many webinars. I have lost track. I'm sorry. That's true. You have. You have, know, you have done a lot of webinars. I'm uh, happy to be back. I'm always happy to be here. <laughs> and we're happy to have you. So this will be <laughs> always happy to have you. Um, all right. So we're going to let people uh, uh, join us here. Um, you know, I was going to just, I, this has nothing related to today's webinar, but um, I just posted an article um, on, on the LaVibra site uh, from uh, do our Dr. Uh, Irene Pepperberg's latest blog. And they're doing a play on, based on Pepperberg and um, in Alex's life. It's like a, like a play, like a, like a, a on stage play. And it just sounds so exciting to, to, to see something huh. like, like a, you know, in the arts like that. And um, so anyways, I don't, I just, I was just uh, very excited to see that because it's just huh. is so, uh, I mean, I, I, I wish I lived in that area. I can't, um, I want to say it's in Massachusetts area. Um, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, sorry. I was just top of my mind. Um, hmm. So um, let's see here, uh, what else are we doing here? Uh, so we have um, a presentation probably, right? I made you, a, are we doing a, a PowerPoint or? Um... Yes. Okay. Oh, you yeah. always have really always. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unless you ask for something else, it's gonna be a PowerPoint. No, PowerPoint is PowerPoint great. Scenario. An animation, just kidding. Yeah. No, that's... <laughs> If you require anything more technologically complex than PowerPoint, I am not your girl. <laughs> so uh, okay. So so who is the who is oh. who is uh, Brenda point out who is the uh, gray behind you? Oh, this is Marco. She's my oldest gray. I owned her parents back about thirty years ago, and I decided she was a baby that I wanted to keep from my own, and she's been with me ever since. And I moved her into the office because I discovered I have a bit of a bullying situation developing. Mm. My youngest African gray, Ruby, who's only about mm, four and a half, five years old, she has never had her wings clipped and she was never put into a cage in the first year. So that is, that is not a happy um, mixture of personalities wow well that was good that you kind of nipped that in the bud so to speak or no oh, oh yeah <laughs> no it's you know my parents live with me so I'm always aware of what's going on and I saw that behavior getting started and I watched it and then I know because I cannot always get Ruby in her cage I'm making progress and I recently I have really found something that works well, but even still, before I was able to make as much progress as I have recently, I would occasionally put Marco in a cage and leave Ruby out. And I saw evidence one day that Ru after I'd been gone briefly, Ruby had been on top of the cage, kind of harassing Marco. And that I will never allow to happen. So I thought I had a perfect solution. I just put the pan in to the play top so that Ruby couldn't get her on the top. But then I saw that Marco had a little um, um, wound on her foot, sorry, on one of her toes. So what Ruby had done is to, on another incident, climb down the side of the cage. So at that point, I thought I'm going to change the antecedent and prevent this problem by moving my long time wonderful companion into my office. So uh, that's why she's here. And now she's like, I'm, I'm on a webinar. This is awesome. <laughs> and she has to be in her cage because she uh, will cavity seek. She sneaks down silently. And before I know it, she's under my desk. So she. 
since I can't practice stationing today, she's got to be got to be cooped up. She can't show us all her stellar personality. Well, she is watching. So somebody asked a question. I saw it flash on the screen about whether this is for just breeders of African greys or finding breeders of African. No, no, no. This is about all parrots and how to go about finding a good breeder if you want to adopt a baby parrot. Okay. Um, well, you know, I guess we'll get this started then. And I was just going to remind people that if you do have a question, we'll try to get to them uh, towards the end. So I'm going to let you take it away. We'll, we'll, we'll Thanks, find it. All, right. all right. I'm going to share my screen. I'll need to close that. All right, there we go. So as we all know, we're talking about finding a good breeder and a well-raised baby today. And I, so before we can understand what a good breeder might look like, we've got to first talk about how baby parrots develop. The first thing I think that we're all clear on is that in the wild, the baby parrots stay in the nest cavity until they fledge. Fledging occurs as a result of an urge, an instinct. And so once those babies fledge, then their first focus is on developing their flying skills. So food independence cannot possibly occur until after that. You've got to be able to fly and keep up with the flock in order to find the food that you need. Now, another thing to appreciate is that all species have different customs. All parrots are not the same and different species have very different customs when it comes to how they nurture babies. We, we have you know, bits and pieces of information that we've pulled from different places. Large cockatoos, we have an abundance of excellent information, thanks to Katie McElroy, who used to breed large cockatoos and used nest box cameras with her wild caught pairs. And what we found is the large cockatoos, I, I'm not sure if this is true for the smaller, spe uh, the smaller um, species as well, but umbrellas and moluccans spend an inordinate amount of time in the nest cavity with their babies. Those babies are never alone. One or both of the parents are in there touching the babies, training the babies, offering all of this nurturing to them. African greys, I don't have information about how much time the parents spend in the nest cavity, and that is true for galahs as well. However, uh, both those species live in large single species flocks. So once the babies fledge, they have a lot of support and teaching from many different flock members, not just uh, the parent birds. Now, Amazons are a, a different example altogether. Ethologists have reported on how Amazon parents behave in the wild, and they have been labeled as slightly neglectful because the parent birds, both of them, stay out of the nest a good part of the time during the day. So the babies in the nest cavity don't get a lot of close physical touching, nurturing. So um, for some of these, these species, the way that we raise babies in captivity um, can have serious implications for them. So let's look at timelines for developmental milestones. What we want to try and get from this slide is an understanding of when, if baby parrots are allowed to develop normally, when they might be food independent. Um, so the first developmental milestone, of course, is flight, after which food independence um, can develop. 
And so the timelines for these two things tend to correspond roughly to the size of the parrot. Budgies uh, can be food independent at eight weeks. When I was raising African greys, the babies that I allowed to become food independent on their own did not develop food independence until 16 to 20 weeks. So if we extrapolate then and you find a baby African gray for sale who's somewhere between 12 and 15 weeks old, you know um, that baby may have some food insecurity issues. That's how we can use this information as we begin to scrutinize breeders. Now, here's the rub, right? Large macaws and cockatoos, they're not usually weaned by their parents until they're a year old. So let's take a look at just the process of developing flight skills. This rather poor photograph was one of mine taken a, of a baby gray who was learning to fledge and fly and develop her landing skills. As you can see, she looks somewhat surprised that she wound up uh, perched vertically on this lamp. And now her challenge is to figure out how to take off from there and then land somewhere more appropriate. It takes at least a couple weeks before baby parrots become proficient at this. They also have to learn how to hover, calculate how you know high to to fly, how um, much power to use with each wing beat. And as they figure all of this stuff out, neural pathways are being developed. And this is really essential to the later confidence and coordination of the adult. You know why I started breeding African greys? Because <clears throat> I wanted one and I couldn't find one that had the qualities that seemed to me that baby parrots should possess. Those being curiosity, a willingness to engage socially. Um, I just found baby greys um, at breeders' establishments who behaved in a fearful way. And I didn't think, I just figured something had to be wrong with our breeding practices, because obviously, so the things that were being written back then, Laura can attest to that, right? Like um, 25 years ago, weren't people writing that African greys were nervous, clumsy birds? Mm -hmm. I saw that all the time. And I thought that can't possibly be true. It, you know, they couldn't survive in the wild if that were the case. So it must have something to do with how we are breeding them. Once I implemented my breeding practices, I raised African greys who were not nervous and they were not clumsy. Okay, so food independence is also a process. This is a photograph from when I was breeding, uh, once I took the babies out of the brooder, I would put them into a cardboard box like this with clean shavings. And this is where they began their early explorations. So regarding food, the process begins with identifying a morsel that you wanna eat. And then for a medium to large size parrot, instinct is going to dictate that they've got to figure out how to hold it in one foot and then take a bite while they're doing so. Then they've got to move that bite to the back of the beak and swallow it. And these are all mechanical skills that have to be developed. A baby parrot doesn't automatically know how to do all this stuff. And then once they can do that, they have to develop an attention span long enough that it can result in uh, a full crop. So a definition of a good breeder, my definition, and, and I think if we're concerned about parrots, anyone's definition of a good breeder has to be that we allow the baby to become food independent at their own pace and allow for a full fledging experience. And, and then one step beyond that, that babies receive that the label that I thought of was captive nurturing. So what does that mean? That while they're being fed, they at least get a bit of human attention. 
and training that is positive so that they begin to associate good things with people. Another way, just for um, those who are interested, another way of providing baby parrots when we are breeding them with captive nurturing is to use nanny birds. When I was breeding and after I brought the babies into the house, I noticed that my adult greys who were living with me as companions, as well as older babies that had not yet gone home, showed an interest in the babies. And so I observed very carefully, but I trust my birds. There was no sign of aggression. And what I found was that those older African greys would seek out the babies, climb into the boxes with them and preen them and demonstrate different behaviors to them, like picking up food or picking up a toy, things like that. So I became famous for using nanny birds, but this shouldn't be a, a single idea that gets lost, you know, once I pass away. Any single species walking bird should be able to incorporate adult birds in with raising babies, even if they're not the actual breeders. And this is an area where we could do so much research, um, just, you know, anecdotal, casual research. Just try it, be careful, but, you know, see if we can't um, bring a bit more of the information that older parrots have to share with younger parrots into our breeding practices. All right, so now let's shift gears and talk about a little bit of history. <clears throat> In the late 1990s, uh, when I was breeding, we were also just beginning to participate on discussion lists online. This was before Facebook, but we were talking and those lists were very high quality. The people who were participating were very concerned about the quality of life for parrots. And we rapidly recognized that there were two types of breeders. There were those that allowed for the things that I'm talking about, fledging, developing food independence um, at the bird's own pace. And so the breeders that tended to use those practices were smaller breeders. We tended to be in love with the species. We were concerned about ethics. Um, and then there were production breeders, very large breeding facilities. They did not allow for fledging. Weaning occurred according to a schedule that was designed to maximize profits. Obviously, the shorter period of time that a baby stays in your establishment, the more money you're going to make. And then another norm for production breeders is little to no captive nurturing, if you will. So eventually things changed. I've picked on Chris Shank by using her photograph here. She was just one of a handful of excellent hobby breeders. We all talked about it at the time. Chris Shank, Phoebe Linden, me, Nancy Speed. There were a number of us who became very concerned about the practice of breeding in general. We were concerned about the ethics of producing animals for sale that had the intelligence and the sentience of parrots. I, I think that one of the ways that you become most aware of just how smart and how emotional these animals are is when you're raising them. So it hit us right in the face that mm, this was a questionable practice. And then there was the lack, uh, I've said here, lack of consumer education. That is lack of consumer um, smarts, um, having any information at all about how to care for parents. And so I wanna throw this rock into the pond here. Along about the time that I was thinking about stopping breeding, Brian Spears said this, 
and it, it makes me want to cry. He says, aviculture is the only farming industry that oh. produces family members. So this is what we struggle with, folks, right? Right now, aviculture is a farming industry. But we expect it to provide us with family members. Yeah. So eventually production breeding becomes the norm and there have been some serious ramifications from that uh, fact. Some species have suffered, some species develop without much of a problem, but overall parrots are raised for profit rather than love of the species. A good example of that is all of the hybridization that is going on. I mean, right now, breeders are just chasing the dollar. That is all they care about, the vast majority of them. All right, so let's look at the species that suffer. Large cockatoos, those that receive lots of nurturing in the nest, because, um, or in the nest, because obviously they're not getting that nurturing in a production breeding facility. And so therefore these large cockatoos go into their first homes with, they know that they're lacking something and that is physical nurturing. We think, oh, she loves to cuddle. This is how cockatoos have gotten this reputation um, of loving to cuddle. They don't love to cuddle and we damage them irreparably by believing that they are cuddly birds and then providing them with this endlessly throughout their lives with us. Instead, this is a temporary need. And if we just recognize that, we could provide it a bit, you know, when these large cockatoo babies go home, but then slowly wean them away from that, which would be what their parents would do. And then uh, large macaws and cockatoos that would normally be weaned at the age of a year, they're, they're missing out on like uh, more than six months these days of that experience. And then of course, those who flock as a single species who fares better, some do. Amazons are pretty much bulletproof. You know, you can, uh, an Amazon can live in conditions with a poor diet, too much hormone production, not enough enrichment, and they still will not sever damage. It boggles the mind. <laughs> you know, in, in, we have seen somehow greys and cockatoos and others as deficient or, you know, somehow too sensitive for living in captivity. No, they are the norm. Instead, Amazons are the ones who are the exception to the rule because we cannot damage them uh, with our, our rearing practices. All right, and, and then those with short weaning periods, small periods, um, they also tend to be the periods with a lot of spunk, right? Conyers, you know, Quakers, so they don't tend to suffer much. And then most other New World parrots who typically in the wild flock and mixed uh, species flocks, uh, they, they tend to do okay as well also. So what are some other desirable qualities for breeders? <clears throat> we want pairs to be housed with privacy in large enclosures with plenty of enrichment. Why does that matter? Because parents, babies learn everything from their parents. And if the parents don't have a good quality of life, they're gonna be edgy and reactive and they will teach the babies to be edgy and reactive. Uh, we also want parents to be emulating, you know, the babies will be watching from the nest box if they're able to, um, if they're in there long enough, watching the parents interact with enrichment. We also want the parent birds to be fed an excellent diet. We want a staff that is stable and nurturing because again, if the parent birds are afraid of people, they're gonna demonstrate that to the babies. Um, and then if, if, we, if you can find a breeder who leaves babies with the parents uh, for either co-parenting or parent rearing, that would be fantastic. So what is co-parenting? 
co-parenting is when you leave the babies with their parents um, for the entire weaning process, but you remove the babies on a regular basis for hand feeding and interaction with humans. I actually don't, don't think that is the best way to go. You know what the best way to go is? This is going to surprise everyone, I would think. Parent rearing is just letting the parent birds raise their own babies. I think that nobody does this because the idea is that the parent birds are going to be um, too wild and they're going to teach their babies to be wild. But what if we breed birds who step up for people? who are friendly to people. I have seen this work really well. Like for instance, Chris Shank allowed two pairs in two separate years to raise their own babies. These were wild caught birds. And so Chris put up a nest box, they laid eggs, they raised these babies, the babies fledged and everything was done by the parents Although Chris was always, of course, in the aviaries, as was I, we were, you know, feeding, cleaning, um, taking care of the birds. So, you know what happened within two weeks of those babies fledging? They were stepping up for Chris. They were as tame as the parent birds were. Why? Because they learned from their parents to be tamed to humans. Now that is really what we wanna to work towards when it comes to breeding parrots. We also want babies fed in a nurturing manner. Um, we want them weaned onto a good quality pellet with some fresh foods as well. I mean, this would be the ultimate, right? And we want babies to learn to step up and, and have other skills beyond that. So this may sound far-fetched to any of you that have tried to purchase a baby parrot. But let me just offer you one idea. These breeders are charging astronomical prices for these baby birds, and they're doing nothing to earn, really. Um, and we could be demanding a whole lot more of them. And I hope if that is the result of this presentation, or I hope that is one result of this presentation. All right, so let's now look at the challenge of finding a good breeder. This can be so difficult that it will make the option of adopting an older parrot seem a lot more like something you might wanna do. Uh, my personal experiences uh, with clients have been very discouraging over the last three or four years, I've had many clients come to me. They want me to help them find a baby parrot to adopt and then bring it home and raise them. They wanted me to just oversee the whole process and help them, help steer them towards success. So I can't find a breeder who abundance wings. Um, Maybe one will identify, uh, maybe one will, um, sorry, contact me as a result of this. So weaning trauma is very common. Clients have had breeders promise to send babies home fully flighted, but then what's happened is the wings were clipped at the last minute, or they were just told that they wouldn't allow the babies to fledge at all. So it, it's a really hard challenge, but let's assume we can do it. So what questions might you want to ask? Um, so I really think that we should focus on breeders. So this means you don't buy a baby parrot from a bird store. It's not the same. So let's say you're dealing with a breeder. You're going to call them up and you're going to ask, how many pairs do you have at your facility? So there isn't a correct answer to this, but the larger number of pairs could mean a lower standard of care. 
This is a parrot breeding operation right there. Nice, eh? No sunlight, long, narrow enclosures. Want to also ask, how are your pairs housed? Do they get enrichment? Do they have an opportunity to bathe? What is the size of the enclosure they live in? Do they get a rest period from producing? If you're going to purchase a baby parrot and you're going to spend thousands of dollars on it, and it's going to be a family member for decades, you have a right to know this stuff. What do you feed your breeding pairs? The answer should not include a seed mix or a mix of pellets and seed because producing babies, eggs, and then feeding babies requires a tremendous amount of nutrition from the parent birds. And they will most certainly develop malnutrition over time eating a diet that contains even some seed. And for African greys, it can have a very um, poor outcome because greys, they don't need more calcium, but they are especially sensitive to low calcium levels. And a seed diet will promote, it will cause calcium deficiencies to occur. Want to ask, do you incubator hatch babies? This is the million dollar question. If the answer is yes, then I suggest you walk away. <clears throat> Long-lived species need to have contact with their parents if they're going to develop normally and not be complete screwballs as adults. So you really don't want to adopt a baby parrot that somebody, somebody took a picture of this baby bird. I am horrified when I see this. This baby bird should not be out in the open on someone's hand like this, for God's sake. Okay. How long are babies left with their parents? It should be at least two weeks, although weather may at times make that impossible. All right, where are the babies located while they are being hand fed? I will admit that the use of this photo is gratuitous because I just want to brag for a minute. This is one of my baby grays, and this is my house when I was raising babies. This is part of their environment year. I had cages on both ends of this banister and I just ran two by fours 12 foot two by fours between them and then I created places for food dishes and the the fresh branches are actually placed down inside of I got PVC that was six inches in diameter and I cut it to a four foot height and put one end down inside of a Christmas tree stand and tighten that down. And then that allowed me to put fresh eucalyptus branches down inside of it. So the babies learned to chew fresh branches, to climb on all kinds of different things. And they were always located right in the, the heart of the home. If you are going to adopt a baby parrot and who's gonna live with your family, it is best if they start out in a family. You want to ask, how are the babies hand fed? You definitely want to avoid a breeder who gavage feeds their babies. What you're seeing here on this advertisement, those metal things, those are called gavage needles. Now, they don't have a sharp end on them. This end... Um, is actually rounded, the, the ball part that goes into the bird's beak. But the idea is you insert the needle directly down into the baby's crop and then deliver the formula that way. Why would you want to do something like that? Because you can feed a lot more babies a lot faster and there's no mess. The babies don't get any formula on their feathers. But it creates a bit of a problem. It, so this absolutely guarantees there's not going to be any nurturing, not even a hand to steady the baby, perhaps, as the syringe is being inserted in its beak. And um, it further makes it harder for the bird to become food independent because they're not even being asked to swallow formula. So when they start to eat solid food, how's that going to work, right? <laughs> it's hard for them. 
All right, when are your babies weaned? The correct answer is gonna always be babies wean according to their own developmental time frames. Every baby is different. So if you get an answer, oh, they're always ready to go by 15 weeks, <laughs> that's not, you, you know that those babies have been forced weaned. What do you wean babies on to? So the best answer, of course, is a high quality pellet, fresh veggies and some fruits. You want to avoid breeders who wean onto seed or onto a nut fruit seed mix. Um, this is a group of babies, fledgling babies, who are learning to uh, eat chop in the morning on a cage top. Do you allow babies to fledge and learn to fly? A no answer should be a deal breaker. They should be allowed to fledge and fly for at least two weeks before having their wings gradually clipped back. Next question, will you send a baby home fully flighted? And if not, what, how and when are the wings trimmed? So um, unfortunately, a very common practice is that the day a baby is sent home, his wings are trimmed right before he's put in the shipping container. That's not fair. And um, that's not a good practice. Babies should have their wings gradually trimmed back. Um, and well, that's all. They should just have them gradually trimmed back. So uh, what do you teach babies before they go home? When I was raising babies, they learned to step up, spend time in an outdoor aviary, being, you know, be comfortable in a cage, shower. This is another uh, photo back from my day of raising babies. Um, we should be asking more of these breeders. If they're going to charge this amount of money for babies, see, there's just a baby um fever, there's a fever for baby parrots in our culture. And the breeders are taking advantage of this. So you're actually going to help parrots in the future just by simply asking more of breeders. Okay, do you provide a health guarantee? When I was breeding, I provided a month long health guarantee. Um, the answer should be yes even if it's not worth much. 72 hours to me, that's not worth much because about the last thing you wanna do after the shock of getting a baby pair at home is then you know, take it to a vet clinic where it might experience fear. But, but they should at least say, yeah, my, my birds are, are free of disease. And then the most important question of all, what do you know about me? Or, or what do you want to know about me? A responsible parrot breeder should care where that baby parrot is gonna go. They shouldn't be willing to just sell it to anybody. Um, and, you know, we're not talking about puppies here, right? Okay. So I should have called this presentation, I think, find a good breeder if you can. So what do you do? Um, if you do all your research and, and you get a baby parrot, you know, I, I would never fault you for that. So what if you do your best and you still wind up with a baby that has problems? Is all lost or can you recover from that? And how do you recover from that? And I'm gonna cover this because these problems are so common. Um, there may be people listening who've had babies with these problems. So let's say that you had wanted to adopt a fully flighted bird and the breeder either would not even entertain the notion or use some excuse at the last minute. Oh, you know, I just, I had to because blah, blah. All right. So all is not lost because as I said, that those first flights occur because of an urge to fly. Now that urge doesn't last forever. An eight-year-old bird who's had its wings clipped all that time will not have an urge to fly, but a, a one and a half year old bird or a two-year-old bird still will. And so all you have to do really is just stop, don't do another wing clip 
let the flight feathers grow out and molt out um, and then replace themselves. And then absolutely get help from a professional because you will need to set up your environment correctly. You'll need to keep that baby safe as it fledges. And, you know, so this is a complex thing, not just something you can do. You need some help from a professional. Now, weaning trauma, that is a bit more serious because it is weaning is both a nutritional and a developmental process. So if you adopt a baby bird who demonstrates weaning trauma, that needs to be addressed. Do not mistake it for a screaming problem as one of my clients once did. Uh, they adopted and a uh, baby eclectus parrot okay. that, that came to them at the age of about 12 weeks. And that baby was constantly vocalizing and they went online and the experts on the social forums told them, ah, it's just a screaming problem. You should just ignore that. Well, no, you don't want to do that. So if you adopt the baby parrot and it vocalizes in kind of a repetitive way and it demonstrates a certain posture at the same time, you should suspect weaning trauma and you should consult a professional who has experience reweaning baby parrots. I've, this is Lulu, who's up on my screen. She belongs to a mentee of mine. We, we got started with the mentoring process, and then she started describing this, this parrot to me. And she told me that this bird had some very unique behavior. She, as she was constantly vocalizing, and it was clear that she was begging in a way Katie assumed it was begging for food, but this bird did it constantly all day long. Now, this bird is four years old. So this is a very good example of a parrot who has not been able to move on with her life because of the weaning trauma that she experienced. So at the age of four years old, this is the way that this baby parrot behaves. Nice, huh? So Katie knew this wasn't normal, and she had gone online many times to search for answers. And she had two main responses from the social media experts. That is so cute. I want one of those. Where can I get a parrot like that? That was not helpful. And then the second one was, oh, that's just normal for cockatoos. This is not normal. And what, what was even more abnormal was the fact that Lulu engaged in this begging behavior constantly from other parrots in the, um, in the home and even from inanimate objects. And so um, I, I told her something needs to be done. We need to rewean this bird which we did. We started offering her formula. Um, so this should always be done with a professional. Um, please do not interpret this as a set of instructions. We started uh, giving her formula three times a day. And I coached Katie on how to mix it up, what temperature uh, to use. All of these are critical details that you should not um, get advice about online. And uh, so <clears throat> the very first time she mixed up the formula, poor Lulu tried to climb into the bowl. She was so frantic to get at it. And she eagerly took three feedings a day within. Oh, and here's something interesting. So during this entire reweaning process that took, I don't know, several, a few weeks, uh, four, maybe four or five. She completely stopped the vocalization within two weeks. Um, and eventually, on her own, she gave up the lunchtime feeding first, I think, 
and then she gave up the evening feeding and then she gave up the morning feeding last, which surprised me. But we just let her do this all on her own. Katie would mix up the formula and offer it. And Lulu just took only as much as she wanted. And then she would toddle off. So during this process, though, she never gained weight. And she never reduced the consumption of her adult foods. I don't know how that works but that is the reality. So she gave up these feedings all on her own and now her feather damaging. So this bird also was continually snipping feathers, barbering and using them to ant with, uh, performing anting behavior with those little snipped feathers. This occupied 100% of her time. This bird now plays with toys. She no longer begs from the other parrots in the household. She responds appropriately to their body language, which she never did before. Her feather damaging behavior stopped completely. Uh, it has ramped up again in the last two weeks, but that's what happens with feather damaging behavior. So this reweaning process created a tremendous difference in this bird's quality of life. And now she can go on and become an adult. Uh, oh, shoot, sorry. Anyway, so in summary, parrots are a long-lived species. Early rearing conditions matter, specifically abundance, weaning, and fledging. And you all as consumers, you know, you drive product quality. Well, what is product quality? Product quality is um, something that's going to determine your bird's quality of life for the rest of its life. So uh, we are really left with a dilemma, folks, aren't we? Thank you very much for listening. Oh, okay. I, I was, wasn't sure if I was on mute or not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Uh, I had to run out. I had a tree trimmer asking to move car. So uh Oh, I was wondering what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was like the urgent knock on the door. Um, no, that was fascinating. And um, we do have a, let's see, we do have, we do have a question. Um, I did okay. need time for questions. I thought. Yeah, we got, talk. we got time. Um, yeah. So Bonnie asks, after baby has stopped eating formula, like on their own, how long um, should they wait before being sent home? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. okay. A baby parrot should be food independent. That means it's not taking any more formula ever. And it um, is not begging for food ever. So two weeks after that, and then you're safe to send them home. Although they may still regress. One of the things that I did was to transfer babies uh, from formula onto scenic diet hand weaning pellets that could just be soaked in warm water and then fed uh, by hand. And so I would send babies home in case they regressed because going to a new home is stressful. So that way they had complete support. So even with that two weeks of not taking anything from me, some of those babies would still want support once they went to their new home. And uh, that was very short lived. And is that the case like across species and, and sizes and, and big parrots, small parrots? Is there a, a variety of uh, any variation or is it like a general general rule? No, thank you very much for asking that question. That would, I think, only be true probably for the medium to larger parrots because the small ones wean in such a short period of time. Okay. Um... Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, the, the, they have a 17 year old gray who has always utilized uh, wing flapping and head bobbing like baby begging when he wants something badly. Um, they've always wondered if this behavior suggested a developmental problem. Um, and um, at this point, is there anything that can be done? Well, the reason that he continues probably to display the behavior is because it's being reinforced. That would be my first guess. 
you know, just because he does that doesn't mean that he's got any sort of developmental delays or anything like that. So when you ask that question, I would ask you the question, well, does he eat normally? Does he interact with enrichment? Does he interact with you normally? Does he seem delayed in any way? And if the answer is no, I wouldn't worry about it. And and like I say, what what often develops in homes is that parents will display a behavior and we give them a bit of attention for it and so they learn oh cool when i do this i get some sort of attention so then the behavior just is maintained uh and it doesn't really mean anything then at that point the only thing it means is that you've been rewarding it and if you stop rewarding it it will probably stop being offered Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, okay. So someone asked, uh, uh, have you written it? Oh, thank you. They, they say, thank you very much. Um, uh, have you written any books about parrots, et cetera, so, on these similar talks? It's, it's in the works. Okay. So here's my future projection. I have a book on flight in the works right now, but I'm also next year. So this year I'm producing a monthly webinar series. The year after that, I hope to produce a course for parrot owners that will also serve as a prerequisite for behavior consultants. So this would be a course then that you could take instead of consulting with me. Um, and then the year after that, I hope to produce a behavior consulting course. And then after that, I'm gonna be producing a much longer book, um, so. Okay, so you're gonna be busy, busy, busy writing here. <laughs> I, I love it. I am, I am busy, <laughs> I like to be busy. That's good, and it's important information. Um, Thanks, that, Curtis. That, so someone asks, uh, is there a difference between um, regressing after going to a new home and wanting formula or is that weaning trauma in or that weaning trauma in disguise? It would depend upon the severity of the symptoms. Now, so let's say you get a baby parrot in your house. Well, how do you know they want formula? You shouldn't be offering it. I mean, if you adopt a baby parrot who supposedly is weaned and you get it in your home, don't offer it formula, that would be encouraging things to move in the wrong direction. But if you get a baby parrot in your home who begs for food, then mm -hmm. that's a sign of weaning trauma. This bird is not weaned. And so then, you know, you would take action to get some help. Okay. Um, oh, and is there observational data on weaning time in wild parrots? That's a really interesting question. I don't believe so. The, the, only, the only focused research that I know right now is being done on the diets of wild parrots. Okay. And unfortunately, they can't get it together to study everything at once. It would be so nice if they could just, you know, study Red Lord Amazons and tell us everything about them, what they eat, when they go to roost, when they bathe, when they wake up, what they feed their, but no, we've got to just study one little thing at a time. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, maybe I'll have to start studying the, uh, the the Amazons that fly over uh, my area. Just kidding. I well, would really no, get that. that would be that would actually be a lot easier. Study the the parents that have naturalized that are closer to us, because you know that's another problem. Trying to study African greys in the wild. I mean, the political um, state of the government for many many years has discouraged any sort of of observational research that might have been done there, as well as the the difficulty of even accessing wild flocks. I mean, you know, it's not like you can drive there. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Now, if you have them in your area, there you go. You could just start yeah. watching them. Right. Yeah. Anyone, anyone's got anyone on tape has those uh, naturalized parrots in the area. Just start watching them and mm -hmm. get back to us. All right. A uh, question about um, 
Do you ever have a, uh, do you ever have to repeat uh, reweaning if, um, for example, like a bird, like Lulu resumes feather destructive behavior after not doing it? So do you ever have to, um, do you have to, have to re repeat? No, because this is a developmental process. And so, you know, as long lived animals mature, they complete developmental processes you know a baby that's learned to walk usually doesn't crawl anymore so just like that a baby who's weaned isn't going to need reweaning um feather damaging behavior is a complex behavior and there are many factors that can influence it in this case i think it's just that temperatures are getting warmer days are getting warmer Plus, there had been some upset in the household. So, you know, feather damaging behavior is just what feather damaging behavior parrots do. And so, you know, we, we can't uh, use it as a barometer that things are terrible or that action needs to be taken necessarily. It, it's got to occur with a lot of other symptoms. So okay. this... The symptoms that triggered the reweaning was the constant vocalization, the begging for food. So even though this bird developed feather damaging behavior, it didn't have anything to do with her weaning process. Okay. Um, let's see if we have time for uh, for another question. Uh, and why that I, I saw it pop up earlier, but um, someone wanted to know what anting meant. So you mentioned oh, anti. You no, know, I, I thought I should probably explain that, but I was worried about time. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for asking. Um, in the wild, some cockatoo species will position themselves over ant hills and allow the ants to crawl up in and out amongst their feathers. I don't believe that we have yet a definitive answer for why they do this. I think it's still a bit of a mystery, um, but another variation on this that they will sometimes do is to pick ants up and put them in their feathers. So, mm -hmm. and so uh, that was what Lulu was doing. She was snipping feathers and putting, putting them into her behavior. Uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm tired. She was snipping feathers and putting them into um, her uh, in between her other feathers. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know they picked them up and actually did that. That's crazy. That's wow. Yeah. yeah. And it was very compulsive also. I mean, she didn't do anything else. So that's a, a key point here. Now she may still feather damage but she's behaving like a normal adult parrot. She mm -hmm. also, in addition to feather damaging, she also interacts with enrichment. She talks, she plays like crazy. She's, I mean, Katie cannot, she can't fly yet. Um, we're hoping that she will grow her flight feathers uh, in and not destroy them. She's just working on her torso right now. Um, okay, but, uh, there we go. Um, let's see. I, I don't. I think that might be all we have time for today. Um, I got to announce our giveaway winner. Um, and well, let's see. What are we giving away? I'll wait for that to come. Um, and also a sneak preview. Next Friday we'll be on with uh, Dr. Tom Tully for another great episode of Ask the Vet. So if you have any questions um, about your bird's health, or just join us to learn from other people's questions about their bird's health, you get a lot of. Uh, you can glean a lot of information either way. Um, and then Pamela, let's see, when are we on with you? Again? March 1st, I think. March 1st. That's right. Um, I have to, okay. Yes. So a sneak preview on what we're doing with you. We are March 1st. That's going to be so close. That is right. We're doing the hormones. So there you go. It's kind of a good piggyback to, to this topic in a little bit. Uh, hormones all about, that's a, that's a huge, huge topic to cover. So <laughs> sure there's. We'll have to see if we need a part two of that one. Um, 
Okay, so let's see who is. Uh, oh, wait, got it. So uh, today's winner, um, and this is going to be some some Lefebvre um, Avocakes or Avocakes, however you want to pronounce that, as well as another um, Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. And that is going to go out to Gina. Gina Hannigan, congratulations. You are today's giveaway winner. I uh, hope that makes your and your parrot's day and weekend. Um, all right. So guys, on that note, I'm going to wish everybody a very... Um, wonderful and uh maybe it's a long weekend for some so um make sure that gives you extra time to, to really spend some quality time with your with your flock hopefully um so uh and pamela thanks again that was that was a a, a needed topic to cover so i appreciate your time and, and joining us today my pleasure and thanks to everybody who attended today i appreciate it it's good to learn i all we're all just reaping in the this this all this valuable information so all right, guys. On that note, everyone have a yeah. great weekend. All the best. Bye, everybody. Your Till next time. Bye.